Hello. So in today's topic, we will be discussing body composition and the components associated with such. So to kick us off, what is body composition? So what are we talking about? Um, why is this important to us? So um, body composition is simply the ratio of fat mass in comparison to fat-free mass. So FM, FFM is fat-free mass, and our fat-free mass consists of bone, muscle, connective tissue, and organs. Our fat mass can, is, um, includes essential and non-essential fats. <clears throat> So essential fats are needed for physiologic function of organs, long-term energy usage, nerve conduction, insulation, and protection. Um, essential fat is stored in bone marrow, heart, liver, lung, nervous tissue, intestines, cell membranes, and brain. Okay. Non-essential fat is stored subcutaneously, which is under our skin surface, and that's what we're actually measuring when we do the skin fold measurements is how much subcutaneous fat we have or how much fat we have under the skin surface. Um, can also be found viscerally as well, so surrounding our visceral organs or kind of internally. And um, <clears throat> non-essential fat can increase our risk of cardiovascular disease, stroke, hypertension, diabetes, um, and many other chronic diseases. Our essential fat levels are about 3% for males and 12% for females. And so essentially, what does that mean? Well, we need a minimum of 3% body fat in order for a male to maintain their normal physiologic functioning. And for females, they need a minimum of 12% body fat in order for them to uh, maintain their normal physiologic functioning. What happens if you dip below those levels? Um, essentially, you're going to have some sort of negative consequence as it relates to um, <clears throat> regular functioning. So for example, with females, usually the first thing to go if we kind of dip below that level is our reproductive processes. So um, you would lose your menstrual cycle or not be able to get pregnant beca because you don't have enough body fat to support um, the growth of a fetus. So why is body composition important for us to measure or assess? Um, an assessment gives us information about our health risks associated with our current weight and body composition. Um, certainly we can understand that an, an increase or um, a larger <clears throat> amount of body fat puts us at a greater risk for some of those chronic diseases that we mentioned. Um, additionally, it might allow us to establish reasonable goals or a uh, having a starting point or a set starting point for weight loss or weight gain um, might also be an important indicator of um, potential <clears throat> sorry excuse me uh, potential sport performance as well so what are some of the factors that affect body composition? Um, average recommended body weight in body composition can vary according to age, diet, and sport participation. Um, certainly our gender or our sex makes a difference as well. Um, as we mentioned, you know, females tend to have a larger or a higher body fat percentage um, because of the childbearing processes. So um, women need more fat in order to support the potential growth of a fetus and also to be able to have the energy necessary to make it through childbirth if that becomes, um, you know, something that happens. Okay. Body fat tends to increase in most people after the age of 35. Um, you know, we see kind of a decline in metabolism as well as a decrease in activity levels. And so therefore we tend to see an increase in body fat for those particular types of individuals. Um, total body mass decreases after the age of 50 years old despite an increase in fat content so essentially what's happening at the age of 50 60 years old um, we're seeing a decline in muscle mass because of a decrease in activity levels and um, additionally we see an increase in fat mass so um, we're seeing this this really drastic change in body composition as people age and again are most of those factors related to um, choice? Yeah, absolutely. So again, we think about, um, you know, lifestyle choice in terms of staying active and doing resistance training to kind of help maintain uh, muscle mass and uh, additionally, you know, really watching our calorie consumption so that um, we are matching calories in versus calories out. 
So again, as we mentioned, you know, as it relates to sex and body composition, women are going to have more fat than, than men uh, for those childbearing purposes. And also this is related to some of our hormonal differences. So um, the two female hormones are estrogen and progesterone. And those two hormones are needed in kind of oscillating uh, levels in order for females to maintain a normal menstrual cycle. And it turns out, you know, what is a normal amount of estrogen or progesterone for a female can vary substantially from person to person. So our like normal levels um, vary quite a bit in, ter in terms of, you know, what is normal. And it, our research has shown that individuals that have high estrogen levels um, have more fat stored in their hips and thigh areas. Okay, so again, females that have this kind of this greater oscillation in estrogen levels tend to store more fat in their hips and their thigh region. Um, again, you know, what's what's kind of the, the science behind this? Um, essentially, you know, the more estrogen that you have, maybe the more motherly you potentially are because um, this estrogen is helping to store fat so that we can support the growth of a fetus. Now, is there any relationship between estrogen levels and fertility issues? Um, yeah, absolutely. So there's certainly kind of a minimum amount of body fat that um, is recommended that you have in order to become pregnant and have a normal menstrual cycle. And really the interesting thing is that can vary so much from person to person, what's normal. Um, and you can see some really lean females still be able to maintain a normal menstrual cycle and still be able to um, get pregnant and, and sustain, um, you know, their pregnancies um, <clears throat> with no issues. So, um, you know, what determines how much estrogen we have or how big these oscillations are for the females? Um, a lot of it's genetics. So again, you know, if mom stores a lot of fat in the hips and thigh region, um, you're also at a higher risk to kind of have that same body type um, as it relates to kind of the hormonal balance. Men um, tend to have more testosterone. Again, um, you know, whether you're a male or a female, you have estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. So we all have all three of these hormones. However, when we look at those levels, you know, women have substantially more estrogen, progesterone. Men have substantially more testosterone. Um, testosterone does a lot of different things for our males, but, um, you know, one of the most important factors when we think about body composition is, um, you know, testosterone promotes muscle mass. So men tend to have more muscle mass. Again, we've talked about how um, hypertrophy is more common in males, um, even though, you know, strength gains are not necessarily um, different for males and females. However, you know, with testosterone, this can enhance um, muscle mass and so therefore have a positive effect for men on their body composition. So we'll talk more about this when we do our debate, but we think about genetics and what role genetics play in fat storage. Um, this is going to be a kind of a wide range, but we believe that genetics account for somewhere between 25 to 40 percent of our fat storage. Um, not only are genetics going to play a role in how much we have stored, but also the location of fat storage as well. So um, again, we do inherit different body types from our parents. So again, think about, you know, do you have the body type of your mom or your dad? And, you know, do you maybe, um, are always kind of have always been kind of lean and muscular and so is your dad for example I know that's true for me like my dad is um, very tall and lean and I have one brother that's also tall and lean and, and same with me like none of us really have to do a lot in order to kind of maintain that like athletic appearance However, my mom and, and my other brother are not built that way. So it's interesting how, you know, people, um, you know, inherit these different body types and, and what role does that play in terms of not only the amount of fat that you have stored, but where you store it as well. So when we think about normal body fat percentage levels, um, these are according to the ACSM standards. I also posted a PDF on eLearn um, that lists all of these standards, um, but I'll kind of go through each of these um, for the females and then for the males. So essential fat for females, again, we already mentioned this was 12%. So that's kind of really the minimum amount of body fat that a female can have in order to maintain normal function. Uh, essential fat levels for males are 3%. 
excellent body fat percentage um, for the females, 14.5%, and for males, 7%. Moving down to good, let's get like a little, like a little highlighter here going. No, I don't want to do that. I want to do, I guess I do want to do that. Okay, so we look at good um, for a female, 19% is good, and for a male, 9.5%. We scroll down to average, average for females, 22%, average for males, 16%, um, below average for females, 25%, and below average for males, 19.5%, and then poor is 32% for females, 25% for males, and our obesity ranges, according to ACSM, 32% for our females and 25% for our males. Um, again, you know, as you were probably writing your lab report, um, you might have found some different numbers here, um, and that's totally fine. So um, ACSM, as I've mentioned previously in the semester, is kind of like our governing body for exercise science, for kinesiology. But there are lots of other sources out there, and there are lots of other organizations who have different standards. So um, that's okay if you use something different in your lab report. Um, just have a good idea of what average is what essential is and what obese is okay so um it's good to have an idea of these i just don't want you to like go out into the personal training world and tell somebody like oh yeah you should your body fat percentage should be three percent or something like that so again i want you to know what average obese and essential is um, so that we really have a good feel for what normal number numbers are This is nothing I'm going to test you on. This just kind of shows, you know, we talked about one of the factors that affects the amount of body fat that we have being the sport participation that an individual is involved in. And this just kind of shows you average body fat percentage for various sports. Um, certainly we can understand that, you know, <clears throat> somebody who is a lineman in football, for example, um, having a higher body fat percentage is, is okay for that particular type of person. Um, maybe same thing with shot put, for example. We see um, maybe higher percentages there because, again, we think about the, you know, the dynamics of that particular sport. We need to um, <clears throat> create a lot of power. And so, you know, having more weight might help us create that more power. Um, whereas, you know, we look at something like, I don't know, like cycling, for example, maybe those levels are a little bit lower because um, they're going to be more of an endurance athlete. So again, just kind of interesting to take a look at the differences in terms of sport participation and um, <clears throat> body fat percentages. Again, nothing I'm going to test you on. I just thought it was kind of interesting. So how do we assess body composition? Again, you already did this. So when we think about the purpose of evaluating body composition for our athletes, um, number one, we can use this information to assess health risks and determine needed behavior change for, for optimal health. And probably number two, and maybe more important when we're working with uh, athletes in the coaching realm, is to help our athletes to determine the best body composition for performance for their perspective or respective sport. So when we think about some of the uh, consequences associated with either too much or too little body fat, uh, we know that excessive amounts of body fat can put us at an increased risk for chronic diseases, including cardiovascular disease, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, uh, cancer, um, many other metabolic conditions that are um, going to be chronic and generally associated with uh, poor diet and lack of physical activity. We can also experience some uh, negative consequences with too low levels of body composition. So this can negatively impact the reproductive system, so it can lead to infertility or uh, fertility concerns, circulatory and immune um, conditions that can be problematic for us as well. Lots of different ways. So we can use BMI, which is simply a height to weight ratio, girth test. So again, we can look at waist to hip ratio um, or our girth measurements, such as just the waist circumference itself bioelectrical impedance, um, air plethysmography, known as the BOD pod, a DEXA scan, skin fold, and hydrostatic weighing. So again, lots of different options in terms of how we can get body composition. So um, in this PowerPoint, I'll kind of focus on some of those methods that we weren't able to use in our lab, and also we'll kind of hit on the pros and the cons of each of these different types. 
So let's start with BMI. Again, BMI is a very simple measurement, if you would even consider it a measurement. Um, it is simply a ratio of height to weight. So again, we're able to um, take somebody's height, take somebody's weight, and plug it into the equation. So it's basically um, their weight divided by their height squared, and give them this number. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Here you can see the chart that compares BMI levels. So again, it would be important for you to know what a normal BMI is. Okay, so um, 18.5 to 25 is considered normal, 25 to 30 is considered overweight, and I kind of like using the little highlighter. And then um, obese is considered 30 or higher. Okay, is this good? Um, it's pretty accurate actually for people that are not active. Um, so BMI it does serve as a good starting point. It also is nice because it's not um, invasive. I don't have to touch anyone. I can simply ask them these things. So um, it's not uncomfortable. Again, as some of you probably felt when we did the skin folds, it's pretty invasive and you have to get up in someone's face and actually put your hands on them in order to get accurate measurements. So um, you know, this is a little less invasive. Um, a good estimate for us, a good starting point, particularly for people that are not active. Um, it is inaccurate if you are a fit person that exercises because muscle weighs more than fat and this standard doesn't allow us to um, take into consideration muscle mass or bone structure. But it does, however, provide us useful information about the degree of obesity and mortality risk. So individuals that have a higher BMI have greater risk of mortality compared to individuals that are um, lower on the BMI scale. Girth measurements. Um, again, we, we looked at the waist, hip, and neck measurement. Um, again, we just used a Gulick tape measure, which is just your standard little tape measure um, to do those. Again, one of the tricks that we talked about in class in ter terms of um, actually taking this measurement is that we want to stand on the side of the subject so that we are not uncomfortable as we you know, kind of stand in front of them. So that's one trick that I think is important when we try to maintain professionalism when t getting these measurements. Are these good? Um, they do indicate for us both body fat percentage as as well as fat distribution. So it allows us to kind of see, um, you know, if somebody is storing a lot of fat in their midsection or in their tummy area, that abdominal fat um, puts us at a greater risk for heart attack, stroke, hypertension, diabetes, gallbladder, and death. So again, when we think about fat distribution, this is an area where we're seeing more research, where we're starting to look into, um, you know, how fat is stored, you know, where it's stored within the body and, and how that makes a difference for us in terms of um, risk factor here. Okay. So looking at bioelectrical impedance, again, this is one measurement that we did do. Um, basically, how does this work? So again, you typed in some information. We used our little handheld one um, here, which they're um, not as accurate as like this Tanita. So this Tanita has four different sites. So it's got two sites up at the top where you put your hands and then the, you also take your socks off and there's two sites on the feet as well. And basically what happens is there's an electrical current that goes through your body. And when you just use the handheld device here, again, that's gonna be a little less accurate than if I had four um, kind of checkpoints for this. And essentially um, what happens is we're looking at the, the speed of the current as it flows through the body okay and fat doesn't have a lot of water in it so it impedes the speed okay so someone who has a large amount of body fat their current would move very slow okay someone who has a large amount of muscle mass also has quite a bit of water okay so there is a lot of water stored within muscle so therefore if someone has a lot of muscle that current will flow pretty fast because it will flow quickly through the water or through the muscle okay um, <clears throat> so again, fat mass has a greater impedance to flow um, <clears throat> in comparison to muscle, and so it kind of uses that information to calculate the percentage of fat. Um, one thing that's important to note with this measurement is its accuracy is highly related to um, hydration. So again, if you were dehydrated, it would give you a higher reading in comparison to someone that is 
well hydrated. Okay. So again, keep that in mind when we look at these numbers. Um, if you weren't very well hydrated, it could read a little bit high for you in comparison to if you had been better hydrated. Um, DEXA scan, again, this is one that we don't have access to because we don't have a DEXA scanner. Um, they're very expensive. We see them in the hospital setting, not many in lab settings, um, more in hospital settings. And again, um, the reason we would use a DEXA scan in a hospital setting would be more likely to look at bone and bone density. So here you can see um, what the De DEXA scan looks like over here. Okay, um, so the, the DEXA scan gives us an estimate of bone density, bone mineral content, and it can also give us information about body fat, which we can see from this image here. Okay, so it can show us that soft tissue as well. Um, very precise, very reliable estimate of body composition. Uh, the disadvantage to using a DEXA scan is the cost of the equipment, the technical support. Again, we wouldn't have access to something like this. Um, some hospitals will do, you know, they'll offer like DEXA scan for body composition. Um, again, that might be fairly expensive, maybe a couple hundred dollars in order to get that tested um, with this machinery. Again, not super invasive. You can see here the guy is laying in shorts and a t-shirt. And um, so it's not an invasive process at all. Um, however, you know, certainly the cons are the cost of the equipment and the um, access to this equipment. Okay, skin fold is a measure that we practiced in our class. And what are we trying to accomplish when we do skin fold measurements? Um, we're able to predict body fat percentage under the skin surface, or we're looking to see how much fat someone has stored subcutaneously. Okay. Advantages to using this, it's relatively inexpensive. One of those calipers is like 200 bucks, um, very portable. So again, let's say I'm a personal trainer or I'm doing you know, um, testing for athletes or something, I can take this to a different building, that's no problem. So it's very easy for me to take this um, to various locations. More accurate than BMI, so it is a more accurate measure of body composition. Now, certainly that depends on the accuracy of the tester. So it takes a thousand repetitions in order for us to be considered um, accurate in measurement of skin folds. Okay, um, so some disadvantages here we can see intra-rater variability and intra-rater variability. What's the difference between these? Intra rater variability or a test performed by a single tester. So let's say I tested your body fat percentage today, which is Tuesday, and today, which is Tuesday, I got 16.7%, um, okay? If I test you again tomorrow, Wednesday, and I'm still the tester, so intra-rater variability, I test you again tomorrow and I get 22%, I didn't have strong intra-rater variability, okay? So one tester, multiple tests, I wasn't very accurate, okay? Inter-rater variability has to do with two different test takers. Okay, so let's say I test your body fat percentage today and I get 16.7%. Um, and then tomorrow, Dr. Figgins tests your body composition and she gets 16.9% um, or something like that. Well, we have good inter-rater variability then. So two different testers test you for your body composition and we get very similar numbers. So again, the more often we do these measurements, um, the better we become at it. Um, again, uh, you'll, you'll do these next semester when you get into fitness assessment. So um, we've kind of tried it out here in this class. And so we're going to get more um, experience with that next semester um, when you are working with your clients one-on-one. -on -one. So how does this work? Again, we kind of demoed all of this in class, but these would be good things to hold on to for next semester when you take fitness assessment. Um, so the skinfold sites, there's nine different sites. There's all sorts of different equations we can use to um, figure out what body fat percentage is based on these various sites. Again, we're gonna use two fingers to pinch. We're gonna pull back, hold the caliper on there, read the number out loud, then pull the caliper off, then our hand comes off. Um, again, we should do three different measurements um, per site, and then we can get the median of those values, or you can get the, the average as well if you'd rather do that, um, depending on you know how accurate you are.
Hydrostatic weighing is another method that we did not do in our class, but another pretty valid method for measuring body composition. And so basically this principle, like you can see the girl, she's down here, this is who we're measuring, and she's in this little like tub, basically. And um, the tub is filled with water. You can see she's got a swimsuit on. And basically it works on the method that body, we're looking at body density um, in comparison to weight. So we're looking at how much water does she displace. So that tells us like the volume of her body or the body density um, in comparison to how much she weighs underwater. Okay, so she, she's sitting on like a scale basically here. And so we're looking at what is her weight in comparison to how much water did she move or displace during this process. So how does this work? Um, fat floats, muscle sinks. So you wanna weigh a lot on the scale in comparison to moving a little bit of water or displacing just a little bit of water, okay? And again, this allows us to quantify body fat percentage based on these two principles. So lean body weight is more dense than fat. So again, muscle weighs more than fat. So underwater, it should weigh more in comparison to the fat mass. Lean body weight takes up less space than fat, so less water would be displaced if you are lean or you have a large amount of, of muscle. The more lean mass you have, the more you weigh underwater. So again, those are kind of the principles that are utilized in order for us to um, <clears throat> figure out your, your body fat percentage based on this method. Um, what are some of the cons of this? Um, you have to wear a swimsuit. You have to go underwater. You have to fully submerge yourself. Certainly, this is not an easily portable device. Um, you can see three testers here. So again, it is, it is fairly complicated in terms of um, getting this measured. The other thing is she's got to put her head underwater and blow all the air out of her lungs in order for us to truly get that body density correct. Um, so that can be like pretty uncomfortable, I would say, for this person. Also, like people don't like to wear swimsuits or get in water, especially if the water wasn't warm. If the water's like cold, you know, that's not super fun. Um, so again, some cons with this. Um, the equipment is, is fairly... A little cheaper than like the deck it's definitely cheaper than the dexa scan um it's definitely cheaper than the bod pod which i think is the next one i'm going to show you um and it's fairly complicated to calibrate this equipment and to um you know get it up and running and that sort of stuff so um certainly some cons with it but it is a valid and a good method for us All right, bod pod, this is one that I'm hoping to get um, that we would have in our new lab, which will be up in Kane, Kane fourth floor. So um, hopefully we will be ordering one of these for our, our newly renovated kinesiology lab. So I'll get back to you um, if, if that happens. So basically the bod pod, this method is the same as a hydrostatic weighing. The only difference here is we're displacing air as opposed to water. So a little more comfortable um, for the participant. So basically what, what's going on is you're going to go inside this little spaceship thingy. Um, it weighs you. So you're like sitting on a little stool in there basically, or it's like a little bench in there that's like built in. And then we shut the door and it seals. Um, and so basically you just breathe normally while you're in there and it'll look at how much you weigh in comparison to how much air you displaced while being in here okay so again probably a little more comfortable for people um, to get in this versus go underwater in a submerged like little pool um, the I guess the the negatives with this um, very expensive it's pretty easy to calibrate this this is a pretty user-friendly piece of, of uh, equipment um, the other issue is you've got to um, basically sit in there like and guys would just wear like spandex shorts females would wear either a swimsuit or like a sports bra and shorts um, so again 
it is a little invasive that way that you do need to kind of, you know, um, be in very minimal clothing to do it. We'd also put like a little cap on um, for females because your hair displaces air as well. So we would cover your head with like a little kind of, kind of it's kind of like a swim cap. Um, for guys, it's not as big of a deal. This guy's got short hair, so it's not a huge deal. Um, but again, to be as accurate as you could be, we would put the little cap on this guy as well. Um, so again, you know, looking at the pros and the cons of this versus hydrostatic weighing, both are pretty accurate. This one is certainly more expensive, but probably um, easier for both the user and the tester um, in order to kind of set it up. And we could do multiple people pretty quickly um, right in a row with this. Ah. I forgot I had this slide. So again, when we compare and contrast the bod pod to hydrostatic weighing, again, both are looking at body mass in comparison to displacement. Um, so again, with the bod pod, we're looking at air displacement. With the hydrostatic weighing, we're looking at water displacement, which is a better method. Um, probably the bod pod, but when we look at cost differences, um, hydrostatic weighing is certainly um, more affordable for a lab to have. Um, hydrostatic weighing is kind of an older method. The bod pod probably came out in, I don't know, maybe like 2008. So it's relatively new, whereas hydrostatic weighing we've been using since like the 70s, I would guess. So, um, you know, a little bit of difference there, but both uh, good methods in terms of getting an accurate body composition. So we think about setting body composition goals um, in order for us to determine if, if we are within a healthy um, weight range or within a healthy body fat percentage range. Um, it's important for us to kind of start with a target, right? So again, if, if you're working with a client um, in personal training, for example, um, it's important for us to know upfront what are, what are their goals? What do they want to be? What do they want to reach? Um, and I think that it's, it's important for us to measure these things so that we can give them a realistic A, timeline, and B, give them realistic feedback like, hey, no, you're probably not going to be able to get to 12% or whatever. So um, it's an opportunity for us to certainly educate people on what is appropriate and you know, what is feasible for this particular person. So first, um, we want to determine the target BMI or body fat percentage that we'd like to reach. Um, if you're happy with where you are, then you can certainly focus on maintenance or of the appropriate body composition, or we could focus on an increase in muscle mass. Um, so there are certainly ways to kind of sell personal training regardless of what their results are um, from the test. Okay. So weight loss goals should be no more than one to two pounds per week. Again, that seems reasonable um, for an individual to A, create a sustainable lifestyle. So again, we don't want to be losing like five or 10 pounds per week. And then um, that person like can't, you know, sustain that lifestyle. So again, it's, it's all about creating a consistent habit. It also gives your body time to kind of adapt to whatever that new weight is more gradually versus um, your system kind of being shocked by, oh, you lost 20 pounds and um, hasn't had time to kind of adjust to that. Body composition changes can be reassessed every eight weeks. So please make sure you write that down. We should not assess body composition more than every two months. And the reason for that is it takes us a while to be able to track those changes. Okay, so um, we can lose about 1% of body fat per month. So essentially what I'm saying is the level of error with your testing methods is higher than 1%. So therefore, it's not effective for us to measure body composition more than every two months. Okay, so body composition cannot, should not be measured more than once every eight weeks. And we can expect a body composition change of about 1% per month. Okay, so again, if I measured you now and you were 16.7, I measure you again in two months, um, best case scenario, we'd be down to 14.7. But again, keep in mind that the error of the tester doesn't always detect those changes. So um, I think that that's really important when we're, wor when we're working with people, you know, these people are working really hard to meet these goals and um, our, love, our measurements aren't accurate enough to sometimes quantify those improvements. So, um, you know, doing those body composition measures only every eight weeks um, is helpful so that we can actually detect those changes that that person might made. Um, so can you do uh, assessments more frequently than that? Yeah, absolutely. You could do um, 
just their body weight. We could do that every week if you wanted to. You could also do like girth measurements um, or circumference measurements. We can do those, you know, maybe once a month if they really wanted to. Um, some people like all that information. They like the numbers. They like that feedback. They like that accountability. Um, so that would be appropriate way to kind of assess them as they move through a, a weight loss program or something like that. Um, but body fat percentage, again, limit yourself to every two months or, you know, even longer in between measurements. How do we know what a healthy body weight is? Um, BMI provides us a good estimate for weight. Um, however, it doesn't reflect the individual's health status um, and doesn't give us any information about body fat percentage. Um, athletes with large lean body mass but low fat content will have greater healthy weights than sedentary people. Okay, so again, BMI is kind of a screening point for us or kind of a starting point, but then it's important for us to, um, you know, take a look at some of these other factors um, in order to understand someone's health status. So when we think about estimation of, of healthy weight, weight related conditions are also important to consider. So um, so when we're trying to figure out, you know, where does that individual want to be in terms of weight? Well, do they have hypertension? Do they have LDL cholesterol? How's that? Um, do they have a family history of obesity, cardiovascular disease, cancer? Um, what's their pattern of fat distribution in the body? So again, we can talk about um, abdominal adiposity. So having a large amount of fat in the stomach region um, puts us at a greater risk for many chronic diseases than maybe body fat stored like in the arms or in the legs or somewhere else. Also fasting glucose levels. So again, understanding kind of um, these other health related factors, um, where is this person at as it relates to those particular issues? So when we think about energy imbalance, um, you know, in order for us to lose weight, we need to um, create a, a negative calorie balance or a negative energy balance. Okay, so um, when we have energy imbalance going the other way, so a positive energy balance means that I'm depositing more calories than I'm expending. Okay, so in order for us to create balance, calories in and calories out need to match. Okay, so that would allow us to maintain weight if we create a negative calorie balance. I'm spending more than what I'm bringing in, same as your bank account, okay, versus a positive energy balance. And again, this is bad in this scenario, but good for your bank account. I'm bringing more in than what I'm spending, okay? So again, chronic positive energy balance um, can result in weight gain and obesity. Obesity is most accurately diagnosed based on body fat percentage as opposed to BMI, but here you can see both standards. BMI greater than 30, and then body fat percentage um, 25 for males, 35 for females. Some of our research will so, show 32% for the females, um, but you know, in this particular example, 35%. Again, I won't try to trick you on an exam or anything because I do believe ACSM says 32% for females. Um, but again, keep those keep those in mind when we think about um, you know what what are the results of this and why do we see this issue um, in our country for example again as we've kind of already mentioned body composition um, is important when we think about its risk associated with many health issues so uh, body fat percentage and high amounts is linked with increased risk for many health problems and then as we also mentioned you know body fat distribution is also an important predictor for health risks so our research is showing that abdominal adiposity is um, more problematic than, you know, adiposity stored in other locations. So what is the set point that I've talked about? So basically the set point is the body has a particular weight range that it wants to be within, and it's approximately a 10% range. So So the, the range is about 10%. So again, imagine that I weighed 150 pounds. Um, at any given point, I would generally fall between 142 and 157 pounds. Okay. Um, again, what allow, like what determines what my set point is versus your set point? Um, research suggests that it's primarily genetic in nature. Okay. So again, maybe you're born with this predisposition that you're going to weigh 150 pounds. 
Okay. Um, <clears throat> some researchers have shown some support for this, and others have said that this is baloney and that there's no, um, you know, there's no true set point for an individual. So let's take a look at either side. So when we think about making these behavior modifications, again, it's important for us to consider all these different things that we need to do or all the different options that we could kind of incorporate into this plan. And one of these plans is certainly going to be restriction of calories. Um, so in order for us to lose one pound, we have to create a calorie deficit of 3,500. Again, that can be a combination of both nutritional and calorie expenditure. Um, so it's important for us to kind of consider all those various components. Um, so decreasing calorie intake is certainly part of our solution. Some different methods that we could look at, um, decrease fat intake, decrease carb, decrease protein, decrease alcohol intake. Um, again, which is, which is the best option for us in terms of caloric? restriction some might just have an approach of total calorie restriction so just you know decreasing portion sizes so not necessarily focusing on one particular macronutrient um, <clears throat> but you know just kind of consuming a little bit less um, you know I'll ask this question in class and students are quick to say decrease alcohol intake um, but again I think it's really important that you think about what's feasible like are you gonna reduce your alcohol intake in order to lose weight um, and be honest with yourself, you know. Um, I'm not personally willing to give up a glass of wine here or there. So that's not maybe as feasible for me as um, potentially like decreasing fat. Like I'm not really a big fried food person. So I'd, I'd rather give up, you know, fried foods and fatty foods as opposed to a glass of wine. Um, so we have to think about what's feasible for the individual what's realistic and most importantly how can we create healthy habits that can be sustainable right i can give up wine for a couple weeks but um, i don't want to do that forever right whereas i don't mind giving up french fries forever that's not a big deal for me so a lot of it has to do with getting to know that person and understanding their personality and and understanding what's going to work best for that individual um, <clears throat> you know when we when we look at the research in terms of what gives us the greatest amount of success. Um, research shows that both low fat and low carb diets can result in significant weight loss. And it appears that diets that are low fat, high fiber are most successful for weight loss and weight maintenance in comparison to low carb diets. However, we do need to understand the individual. Again, if that person doesn't mind cutting out carbohydrates, then maybe that would be the better option for them. Um, so again, you know, it really has to do with, with what's feasible and, and what that person is willing to give up or sacrifice. Um, you know, I think when we think about low carb diets, it's harder to sustain like in real life. Like I could cook low carb at my house, but like, what if I go out or what if I go to uh, like a holiday party, for example? Um, it's going to be a lot harder for me to avoid carbohydrates in those scenarios um, than maybe options that are low fat in nature. Um, so again, I think a lot of it has to do with kind of just understanding what's reasonable for that person. Um, tips for reducing calorie intake, we should read nutritional labels and really have a good feel for um, how many calories are in particular items. Uh, also using a food tracker, um, whether that's just like, you know, I've had people just use like a notebook and just write things down what they're eating. Um, or there's all sorts of different apps you can have on your phone or different trackers for websites, things like that, um, where you can kind of tally in those calories that you're consuming um, in comparison to, you know, logging your exercise or activity throughout the day. So individuals that use some sort of food tracker or food diary are two to three times more successful than those that, who do not. So um, it does tend to be a, a good method for us in terms of us actually paying attention to what we're putting into our mouths. Um, you know, and again, I think about oh, when, when working with a client, I've heard a lot of times just that accountability piece, knowing that someone else is going to be able to see what they're consuming uh, makes a difference in terms of, you know, making that decision whether or not I want to have that second cookie or not. <clears throat> so when we think about behavior modification, um, again, it's important for us, again, I can't stress enough how important it is in this field to get to know the person that you're working with. 
and understanding that everyone's different, everyone's challenges are different, and how I might help someone is going to be different depending on what those challenges might be. So problem behaviors um, lead to excess calorie consumption and also physical inactivity. So um, it would be important for us to kind of get to know this person and figure out what those problem behaviors are. And, you know, a lot of that is self-reflection and, and figuring out what are the problem behaviors for you, right? Um, <clears throat> So for my husband, for example, um, his, one of his barriers to physical activity is the time of day. So if he doesn't get up in the morning and do it in the morning, he's not going to do it. Or if it's like an afternoon or evening thing, he has to be meeting a friend or something to go for that run or to go for that bike ride or whatever. Um, otherwise, he's just not going to do it. Um, so in terms of you know, what allows him to be successful, it's, it's gotta be, he's gotta do it first thing in the morning, or he's gotta meet up with a friend at lunchtime or whatever to go on that run. Um, so those are, are things that he needs to do in order to make sure that he's successful. Okay. So some of his barriers to physical activity are like evenings, like he wants to, um, spend time with the family or whatever. And so it just becomes less of a priority. Um, so, you know, understanding those particular issues for people and, and what are some of those barriers, okay? Other problem behaviors, um, <clears throat> maybe it's um, going out for, um, you know, drinks after work or something like that. And, you know, um, now I've not only skipped my run, but I've drank, you know, a fair amount of, of calories and now I'm going to order some crap thing for food because I've been drinking. Okay. So again, um, kind of a, a double whammy there in terms of excess calorie consumption and physical activity. So again, thinking about those problem behaviors, um, identifying those, and then am I saying to not go get drinks after work? No, but plan your day around that. So, you know, get up early and get that workout in or get a lunch workout in and then maybe try to eat healthy throughout your day. So have a good breakfast, a good lunch so that I know that, you know, that crappy decision that I make at dinner time isn't as bad or, you know, can kind of balance itself out a little bit um, depending on, you know, <clears throat> what you've done, right? So again, I'm dipping a little bit into exercise psychology, but thinking about behavior modification, um, first thing we need to do is chain breaking. So separating behaviors that tend to occur together. So again, if I drink, I'm going to eat shit food. Okay. So how can I separate those two things out? Stimulus control, put us in charge of our temptation. So I'm not saying not go drink, but maybe we limit ourselves to X amount of days per month or per week or whatever, however you want to do that. Cognitive restructuring, change your frame of mind. So again, um, think about how you want to approach this situation differently um, under these kind of circumstances. Contingency management, prepare for situations that may trigger overeating or hinder physical activity. Um, so again, you know, like I said, plan your day around that. If I know that I'm going to do this, okay, what can I do throughout the day to make myself healthier kind of early on in the day so that it's less of a blow, I guess, later in the day. And then self-monitoring, kind of record what's going on and when did you make these bad decisions um, and, you know, and then allow yourself to kind of limit those particular triggers. So when we think about practical applications for our athletes, um, factors that we need to consider when we're assessing body composition, number one are the needs or the goals of the athletes. So again, kind of understanding um, what are appropriate goals for them and, um, you know, time frame in terms of when they should be kind of aiming to achieve those goals. And then also what's the most appropriate method for your situation based on uh, resources, so time, cost effectiveness and equipment available uh, to you. And again, we can kind of think about this in terms of the age of our athletes and how comfortable they are as well. Um, skin folds can be a little bit uncomfortable for athletes. Um, so, you know, I think making sure we're respecting them in, in those regards as well. It's also important that we consider validity, accuracy, and reliability of each of those methods as well. 
A few other key aspects to keep in mind is that body composition does not directly determine performance in sport. So while we might have um, these, these ideas in our minds in terms of what is the appropriate body composition for an athlete, um, you know, based on what we believe, um, this doesn't directly determine their performance in sport. However, it can be relevant for us to measure depending on the athlete and the sport type, and measurements can uh, be used to help us improve inform appropriate training and nutrition strategies uh, to best suit and best serve the athlete. <clears throat> And just a few key takeaways. So the evaluation of body composition is relevant to help us to determine behavior changes for optimal health and also help our athletes to determine what's optimal for performance in their respective sports. Um, there are lots of different ways that we can uh, measure body composition. And again, we should consider the needs of our athletes and the resources that we have um, when deciding what's appropriate uh, to use. <clears throat> 